Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for February 14th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk all things CircuitPython. I'm Scott, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny control computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchase, purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about up upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask to add you to ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. And I should note that next week is on Tuesday. Next week is 24 hours later than normal uh, because it is President's Day here in the in the U.S. So I was just double checking that, but that's true. So uh, next week, the meeting will be on the 22nd, not on the 21st. So I will try to make that clearer and all the stuff that we're doing as well. Um, but just a heads up. Uh, the meeting's a day uh, 24 hours later than normal next week. Um, okay, there is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and the recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python on microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from what we're all up to. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. It takes a couple of minutes, so take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. Uh, the fifth and final part is in the weeds. Uh, in the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time is too long for status updates. And that covers how the meeting will go. And I'll move on to the first section and take a time code and get this show on the road. So first up, uh, this is community news. This is a chance for us to talk about all things CircuitPython. Uh oh, <laughs> CircuitPython, MicroPython, and Python on hardware. Um, thank you to Anne for putting these together, and whoever accidentally deleted stuff and uh, undid it. Thank you for that as well. Um, okay, so the first thing we have here is uh, 500 Adafruit projects have been certified. Products have been certified by the open source. At certified as open source by the Open Source Hardware Association, OSHWA. Adafruit is an open, open source hardware and software company. Uh, to that end, Adafruit has been working to submit many of their boards for certification by the Open Source Hardware Association. Uh, according to OSHWA, the certifi certification program exists to make it easy for creators and users to identify hardware that follows the community definition of open source hardware maintained by OSHWA. Hardware projects that display the certification logo are licensed and documented in a way that makes it easy for users to use and build upon them. So on February 7th, Adafruit hit the milestone of 500 certified projects and was the first to reach this number. By registering, registering their boards with OSHWA, Adafruit aims to ensure that users ensure users that products are the products they sell are open source and easy to learn about. Adafruit extends a special thank you to everyone who made this possible, but especially the wonderful folks over at Oshawa who set this all up and were incredibly helpful throughout this process. 
Additionally, they thank the community that keeps this all going and encourages them to publish, share, and more. And thanks to Foamyi for putting the link in. Uh, next up, uh, Circuit Python. Oh, take it. Let me take a time code. This is my first set of time codes I've taken where I don't have m the number keys labels. <laughs> so I'm, I'm working on that. Um, okay, so Circuit Python 7.2.2. Oh, Alpha 2 was released. Uh, it was released this uh, past week. It is the second uh, release published or second published alpha release for 7.2. It is relatively stable, but there will be further additions and fixes before final release. Notable additions to 7.2 since 7.1 are continued work on the Raspberry Pi Broadcom board support. Support for the ESP32 S3 and C3, including some BLE. Uh, RP24. 40 PIO optional side set support. Uh, the addition of the Stemma I squared C board uh, singleton constructor, which is available on every board that had, has Stemma con connectors. Uh, Bin ASCII CRC32 is added, and Vector IO has a dot contains now as well. So those are some highlights. Next, we have. Uh, the Raspberry Pi beta test network install of Raspberry Pi OS. Until recently, you've always needed to use another computer to run Raspberry Pi Imager or to run something similar to let you flash your operating system onto an SD card when you get a new Raspberry Pi. But how do you get the operating system onto an SD card if you don't have another computer in the first place? There is a new beta version of the Raspberry Pi bootloader that implements network installation and we'd like your help to test it. The new network install feature can be used to start the Raspberry Pi Imager application directly on the Raspberry Pi 4 or a Raspberry Pi 400 by downloading it from the internet using an Ethernet cable. The Raspberry Pi Imager application, which runs in memory on the Raspberry Pi, can then be used to flash the operating system onto a blank SD card or USB disk. That's very interesting. Next up, uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, OS 32 versus 64-bit uh, benchmarks have been published. Uh, Raspberry Pi 32-bit benchmarks have been compiled. Most operations benefit from the 64-bit software use. The best speedup is per for performing the Sysbench CPU test, a 1,380% speedup. Overall, using the 64-bit operating system gave a 48% faster response overall. And next, the PyCast celebrates 10 years of Raspberry Pi. Uh, new episodes with Lady Ada, Evan Upton, and more. The podcast celebrates 10 years of Raspberry Pi. Um, Lemores will be live cast t uh, tomorrow, February 15th at 2.30 p.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern. That's 7.30 p.m. UTC. Um, so heads up, that's, that's coming tomorrow. It's it's marked in here as today because this will go out tomorrow morning uh, in the newsletter, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, but we have one more thing to talk about before we get uh, to wrapping up this section. Uh, the sensor watch on CrowdSupply is circuit Python compatible. The sensor watch is a microchip SAM L22 based board driving a watch LCD. It's designed to fit into a vintage Casio watch body. It has connections for sensors to make it versatile and a design goal is ultra-long battery life, months at a time between charges. There is a thread on Twitter where, where developer Joey Castillo discusses getting CircuitPython working. Um, and I, I gave a tip to Joey on that, and made, he made progress as a result too, so that's great. Um, okay, so that is the uh, community news. Uh, the CircuitPython, uh, the community news comes from the CircuitPython newsletter, that is, which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday morning. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub. Uh, at github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython dash weekly dash newsletter and uh, submit a pull request. You can just click the little pencil icon in the top right and edit it there. Uh, with the ch those changes, uh, 
You may also ta just tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com and we'll ha happily add uh, the latest news for you as well. Okay, let's move on to the next section, uh, which is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a chance for us to take a look kind of more objectively at uh, how things are going within the broader CircuitPython community. Um, so I will start overall and then go to, I will do the core and then we'll kick it over to Katni and Melissa for the libraries and Blinka updates uh, in just a bit. So first off, overall, we had 58 pull requests merged from 28 different authors. So thank you to all of our authors. Um, some new names that I haven't seen that maybe uh, maybe were covered before, but th this this is my perspective is uh, some new folks, new authors are Anger, Joe Deller FC, Jonas Schatz, Tawes, uh, VP Tech Ops, M uh, Lashley, D dash A dash V, and uh, Stefan Hinterholze. Um, those are all new authors and. So that's out of the 28. So thank you everybody there for authoring PRs. And then on the reviewer side, um, we had 12 total reviewers for those 58 pull requests. And I just wanted to give a bit of a shout out to Tectric and Unexpected Maker, who I th don't often see on this review list. So thank you to all of our reviewers and uh, welcome to those newer folks. Uh, next up, we had uh, issues wise, we had 38 closed issues by 18 people and 17 opened by 14 people. So we're net down 21, which is awesome. Um, and we have, you know, more than a dozen people interacting with issues on, on either side of this, so opening or closing them. So that's awesome to see people involved. Okay, next up for the core specific numbers. We had 22 pull requests merged from 16 different authors. I won't highlight some new folks here, but I'll say thank you to all of those authors. Really appreciate it. Uh, we had five reviewers. So thank, you. thank you as always to our reviewers. We're always looking for more reviewers. So if you're interested in uh, making the leap into reviewing, please let us know. We'd be happy to help get you there. Um, and uh, we have 12 open pull requests where three of them are over, over 100 days old. So we should take a look at those. And then actually the, the remainder are 31 days older or less. So that's been pretty awesome as well. Um, issues wise for the core, we had 12 closed issues by five people and 11 open by eight people. So we're net down one for a total of 503 open issues. This number is sl growing slowly. It's not the end of the world. Um, the way that we kind of prioritize what, to, what the Adafruit funded folks are going to work on uh, sooner rather than later is through the milestone system. So we have kind of 7.2 milestone, which is the thing that we're wanting to do uh, soonest. And then 7.xx are things that we should probably do sooner rather than later. And then we have a long-term bucket that is uh, stuff that we're going to do in the long term. So we have nine open issues for 7 to 23 for 7x and then 440 for long term. Uh, there's a few other buckets there. That's why they don't add up, but that's generally the idea. And I think um, I think a lot of us are feeling that we probably want to get 7.2 stable release sooner rather than later. So I would not be surprised if those numbers, uh, we, we took a look at these issues and kind of shuffled them around a bit. So uh, don't be surprised if that happens as well. Okay. And with that, uh, let's get the library update from Katni. Thanks, Scott. So this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras. Over the course of the last week, we had 31 pull requests merged from 12 different authors. And I want to point out that most of these authors are the new folks that Scott read off um, earlier, which is really amazing to see, and 10 different reviewers. And once again, welcome to Tech Trick uh, for joining the review team. Um, we That leaves us with 17 open pull requests, which is just bonkers low. I'm very excited. Um, we had 22 issues closed by 12 people and five open by five people, leaving us with 625 open issues across all of those repositories. Uh, 219 of those are labeled good first issue. 
If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, consider going to circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. Um, if you're interested in reviewing, check out the open pull requests. Leave a comment that you um, tested it if you have the hardware. If not, let us know that you took a look at the code, that it looks good to you, or it doesn't. Um, it's very, very helpful. And once you're comfortable with that, we can look at upgrading you to joining the review team. If you're interested in contributing code or documentation, check out the um, issues list. If you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start, and we've got plenty of those available. Um, we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to help out. We would like you to be able to contribute in a way that works for you, so we are always available to um, help you along that process if that's something you're interested in doing. Uh, in terms of library updates in the last seven days, there's one new library, the CircuitPython ADXL 37X library, and a number of updated libraries, which I will not read off, but they are in the notes if you are interested. Uh, and that's pretty much where we are with the libraries. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, let's get an update on Blinka from maker Melissa. Hello. Thank you, Scott. Um, for Blinka, which is our uh, CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython and Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. Uh, this week we had five pull requests merged by four authors and four reviewers. Um, there are currently six open pull requests amongst all the different repositories. And there were four closed issues by three people, one open by one person, leaving a net of 70 open issues. And there were 16,676 PyWheels downloads in the last month. We are currently supporting 87 boards. And that's where we're at. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Maker Melissa. All right, and that's it for the State of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Uh, next up, we have the first of two round robins, which is Hug Reports. Um, Hug Reports is a chance for us to say thank you to folks for the work that they've been doing within the, the community. Um, I will start and then we'll go through the list as is in the note doc. So it's not the end of the world if it's not out of uh, alphabetical order like we used to do. Uh, we'll just follow the notes doc and see where that takes us. So uh, if you do want to speak up, make sure you're listed there uh, so that I go to you. Otherwise, I may miss you. Um, so next up, I will start after I take another time code. Um, so first, a hug to Eva Iharada for doing the unsung hero, being the unsung hero of releasing libraries. Uh, she keeps the library releases going, and it's awesome. So thank you for doing that, Eva. Uh, next up, a thank you to Anecdata for continuing to improve the ESP Wi-Fi APIs and experience. Um, and lastly, a hug report to Tammy for the type PRs and tech trick for doing the reviews for those PRs. With that, I will go to the next person and read off from Anecdata. Um, who says, a hug report to Michael slash purples and Dan H for helping getting my CircuitPython build environment working again. And next up is Dan. Hey, thank you. Uh, thanks to Tetric for continuing to do a lot of type annotation stuff and starting to review um, library PRs. That's terrific. And uh, kudos to Tammy Makes Things, who's starting to work on a whole lot more PRs, whether submitting or reviewing as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, hug reports this week. Uh, first one for Nirdoc, um, who converted a old pure Python library called PyFlate. Um, it hadn't been updated in many years, and it was using Python 2 syntax. Nirdoc updated it for us so that we can use it on Python, excuse me, it updated it to use Python 3 syntax so that we can then use it on CircuitPython. Um, Anecdata also helped look into the API that is returning the response that needs this uh, zipping functionality that uh, we kind of got led to. Um, thank you, uh, echoing uh, what a couple of folks have said. Thank you to Tammy Makes Things for getting involved and doing typing PRs and other things around the libraries. Um, also echoing other folks, thank you to Tectric and congratulations and such for joining the review team and continuing to help out uh, in lots of different places across all the libraries and um, also for a prompt fix inside of Blinka this week. So thank you to Tetric. 
um, to uh, Mark Gambler um, for looking into a older PR on the core that was dealing with that gzip uh, functionality that kind of goes along with my first two hugs. And then uh, lastly, a group hug to everybody. Thank you uh, for everyone who contributes to the amazing community and especially everyone uh, that sent good wishes my way last week when I ran uh, the meeting for the first time. So thank you to everybody. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Filmy Guy. Next up is Jeff Blur. Hello. Uh, yeah, I just need to hug Foamy Guy once more for doing more and more. Uh, thanks to Dan for doing that next pre-release of 7.2. To Mark Gambler for reviving interest in the native modules and fixing some build problems with them. And I'm sorry, but I couldn't resist tinkering further with it and submitting a separate PR because I never can figure out how on GitHub to work in somebody else's PR branch. Uh, anyway. To Katni for uh, continue, continually wanting to grow your coding abilities, and I'm looking forward to a little bit of pair programming with you soon. To Lady Ada, thank you for the reviews and constructive feedback uh, about my work on Adafruit Floppy. To Eva Harada for your keyboard projects. Uh, it's fun seeing those guides uh, getting close to release, I think. And to my friend Steve, who is not on the Adafruit Discord for the loan of a classic Commodore SX64 computer, for the floppy project. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you, Jepler. Next up is Jerry. Hi, uh, where'd it go? Uh, come back here, there it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks to uh, Katni and Andin for uh, a quick response to a moderation request that I um, did over the weekend. It was nice to get some quick quick feedback. And Dan, thanks for the uh, HTTP server demo. It's uh, nice to play with. And a group hug to everybody else. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. Next up is Katni. I got a long list today. Um, That's so, because there's so many awesome people. Yeah, and my categories, apparently. <laughs> um, so uh, first up to Tech Trek for joining the CircuitPython Librarians review team. Um, a lot of people have covered that, but um, I really appreciate uh, that. The reason for that was so that Tech Trek could fix all the readmes on the libraries, which is also a great thank you. And for fixing the cookie cutter bugs I found when generating a new library, there were things that we updated elsewhere but hadn't been updated in cookie cutter. Um, and in addition to fixing all the readme's, Tech Trick really jumped in and, and started reviewing a lot of PRs, and that's been super helpful. Um, to Tammy Makes Things for submitting PRs to the libraries for open issues. To Carter for helping me find something incredibly obvious that I couldn't find. Um, to Jeff for offering to help me with some code. I'm looking forward to that. Um, to Foamy Guy for updating a guide for me. Uh, to Mark Gambler for writing two new pages in the iLights guide for the new IS31 code. Um, that's the native uh, slash additions to the library bits um, that makes things run faster in CircuitPython. Um, and that's really good because I know people were really interested in that sort of thing. To Dan for the latest CircuitPython alpha release. Um, to Paul for the upcoming CircuitPython show podcast. I am recording my episode this week. Um, to everyone who was involved in finding the three layer deep Sphinx bug last week. I think Tectric has all the names coming up. Um, it was it was in it was it was like three different libraries that you had to get through before you found the actual issue. Um, and Thanks to Tech Trick for submitting the quick fix and a group hug to everyone. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katni and Kat. Um, next up is KMatch. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So first hug is uh, related to some Discord discussion on the capabilities of the ESP32 S3. And uh, Deshipu gave me some interesting reading material on how to drive RGB displays. Uh, so that was useful. And second thanks is thanks to Katni. Thanks for always being welcoming and willing to listen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, KMatch. Next up is Maker Melissa. I wanted to give a hug first to Jepler for keeping on top of the Dublin Linux talk preparations. A uh, hug to Anecdata for testing out the Pi Portal uh, earlier today. Uh, hug to Katni for quickly reviewing a PR they've been sitting for a couple of days, and uh, hug to everyone who had submitted a PR issue that needed my attention for and for having the patience to wait as I finished up the little FS project and group hug to everyone else. Awesome, thank you, Melissa. Uh, next up, I have notes from Mark Gambler. 
Mark says, hug report to Jepler for looking at the native mod work I was experimenting with, and a hug report to Katni and Anby for help on the learn system. And next up is Tammy Makes Things. Thanks. So um, I have hugs for Foamy Guy and Tech Trick, and also for Lady Ada. I forgot her on that list for helping me a ton with a bunch of those pull requests related to type annotations. It was very interesting to discover the limits of my understanding of something I thought I understood. So always an opportunity to learn and a group hug to everyone for being amazing. Thank you, Tammy. All right, last up, I've got notes from Tectric, who says, uh, first, a hug report to Foamy Guy, Carter, Dan H, Naradoc, and Katni in helping find a bug in Blinka's CircuitPython typing module quickly. Hug report to Katni and E. Harada for helping me roll out the patch to the readmes and trusting me not to squash and rebase everything. Uh, hug report to Gambler for help with explaining the review process. Hug report to Dan H for getting Blinka to work with the CI so we don't have to mock import CircuitPython typing or other libraries anymore. Hug report to Tammy, Tammy makes things for the awesome typing PRs and for being patient with me being new to the review process. And lastly, a group hug for everyone being so helpful and welcoming. Uh, thank you all. That's it for hug reports. Uh, let's keep on rolling right into status updates, uh, which is the, sorry, I can't talk and take time cuts at the same time. It just doesn't work. Um, Status updates is also done as around Robin, but this time we want to hear a little bit about what you've been working on in the past week and what you plan on working on in the coming week. It's a great way for folks to find ways or things to collaborate on and just give some tips or tricks if somebody's working on something that you've worked on in the past or may have looked up, looked at uh, in the past. So um, this is a great way to see just kind of also the breadth of everything that's going on in CircuitPython land, which is always amazing. So uh, thank you all. Uh, I will start, and then we'll go down the list of uh, folks in the notes doc. So first up, uh, last week I was wrapping up the BLE work on the ESP32 S3. I have a PR out for GAT client support. I've got a PR out for the packet buffer test example, so that's in the BLE library. And then I also did the uh, updated or created a second broadcast net bridge. Broadcast net is this like collect san sensor data from uh, wirelessly from throughout your house over BLE. And the bridge is the thing that, that listens to those BLE broadcasts and, and logs those to Adafruit IO. So uh, I have a PR out to the broadcast net repo that does the bridge on a, an ESP32 S3 uh, instead of needing a full on Raspberry Pi like it used to be. Um, and then on Friday, I started looking into USB host on the RP2040. Um, I got the example code going. It works with a Microsoft mouse that I've got here. So that's a, that's a start. Um, and uh, this week, I'm planning on uh, bringing that USB example code into the tiny USB, into tiny USB's host stack and getting more familiar with both the example code and with tiny USB's host stack and trying to get them collaborating and working together uh, as a prerequisite to getting this all into CircuitPython. So that's my week. I should also say that I'm out probably Thursday afternoon and then uh, next week because it's a holiday on Monday, I'll be, uh, I, I'll, I'll be off on Monday as well. All right, next up is Tammy Makes Things. All right, thank you. So last week I submitted a bunch of PRs for type annotations in the libraries. There's one that is still in flight. We're working on a, a question with that one. The others have been merged. Um, I submitted a PR to add a command line option to the PICU you command line utility to specify the baud rate for serial connections. I started working on a circuit Python class that represents a deck of cards for a project that I'm working on. And I'm trying to make it as generic as I can. So it might be able to be added to the community library bundle at some point. Um, I want it to be able to shuffle cards, pick cards, and I want cards to know how to draw themselves on a display IO group. So <laughs> working on that, um, I did a bunch of configuration and setup stuff for my first electronics making stream on Twitch, which, oops, typo there, that should mm -hmm. be Twitch, which I'm hoping will happen this evening, Arizona time. Um, we'll see how that goes. 
Uh, this week, I'm going to continue working on all of those things, and I'm hoping my first Twitch stream will be tonight. The link is in the notes doc, and I will probably not be here for the next meeting. I'm out of town Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, and I'll be traveling Monday, so I probably will not be here. Okay. Uh, feel free to drop notes for the meeting next week if you've got them. And also, uh, when you go live on the stream, feel free, feel free to post your link on the live broadcast chat. Um, oh, cool. To Thanks. let people know that you're doing that there. Thanks. I think, I I think that's, definitely... yeah, I think that's the place. Is cool. it, is Thank it you. that or do we have a separate announcement channel as well? I think we might... Um, I don't know. I think, we... I think live broadcast chat is usually what I do. Okay. Yeah. Works for me. Thanks. Cool. Uh, yeah, the announcement channel is only for admins, so the chat will work just fine and can get people following your streams there. Uh, all right. Uh, next up is Dan. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, at the end of last week, I released uh, 7.2.0 alpha.2 because it was kind of overdue for a release. With a, there were a bunch of accumulated changes. Um, I mean, as you read at the top, as Scott read at the top, there are a bunch of interesting things in there, probably most notably the stemma, board.stemma i2c, which is really handy. Um, I started looking at Adafruit requests to modify it or to add some async possibilities to it or copy the code or structure or whatever, but use it as a starting point. And I found some things that I, I wanted to fix in it. Um, partly because there's some stuff in there that simulates doing split and other things in CircuitPython 6. It's not really necessary anymore since we don't have to support CircuitPython 6 with that library anymore. So I may eventually have a PR for Adafruit requests. Um, I created a new library, which is strictly for type annotation called Adafruit CircuitPython typing. That's the CircuitPython typing um, module which right now is inside Blinka. And it seems appropriate to me to move that out of Blinka because it's not always associated with Blinka and we can maintain it separately from Blinka. So that Blinka is not, doesn't, all these additions of new types and type annotations don't, don't have to go through Blinka. So eventually I will uh, try to get that working and change the few places where we need uh, like add this as a, as a dependency on a few libraries that do use CircuitPython ty typing right now. And finally, I fixed a bug, a time jumping bug on SAMD where somebody who checks the time all the time noticed that sometimes uh, time.monotonic nanoseconds goes back or forward by three days, which isn't so great. <laughs> and uh, that person hasn't reported back about whether it's been fixed, but I hope that it has. Okay. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, we almost invented time travel. Um, all right, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, so this past week, I uh, got about half of the Winamp uh, player that I've been working on for Pi Portal. I got about half of the guide done, and I did a bunch of uh, commenting and documenting the code um, so that that's ready to get posted. I just need to wrap up the last uh, couple of pages, and I'm hoping to do that this afternoon. Um, I started a prelim preliminary work on a project to pull data from this government web traffic uh, API, but ran into a hurdle because it, uh, the server only sends data gzipped. Um, even if you try to ask it for plain text, it will respond to you with gzip data. So it seems that browsers handle this automatically. Um, and so I didn't realize this until I got started on the microcontroller. Um, but I do have a couple more things um, to talk about that later in the weeds. Um, so I, I did start looking into the options for that. And like I mentioned, I'll um, talk a little more later. Uh, but the other stuff I got up to was testing some tweaks inside of Cookie Cutter and then looking into the issue that arose from the uh, CircuitPython typing uh, that ended up in a, a fix inside Blinka. Uh, and so that's what I've been up to. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Foamy Guy. Next up is Jepler. Hello, this ended up being kind of a long uh, block of text, even though it didn't feel like a lot. So last week was another week of floppies. Um, while doing that, I successfully learned how to use the second core on RP2040, 
to enable streaming flux data to the computer in real time. That's in the Arduino environment. In fact, most of this is in the Arduino environment. So uh, keep that in mind. I successfully wrote a D64 non-copy protected image to a floppy and booted it on a genuine Commodore SX64, which uh, my friend told me is the portable version of the Commodore 64 and the first color portable computer. And we put a video of it up on the Adafruit YouTube and the Adafruit blog. I'll drop that link in just a second in the text chat. Uh, there is one weird MFM decoding bug that appeared with the new feature, so I need to chase that down before we can think about merging the feature into Adafruit Floppy. Uh, and as far as that relates to CircuitPython, uh, I'm still waiting for the repo, uh, the, the Arduino repo, repo to settle down before adopting, adapting the latest to CircuitPython. So if you want to try it, you still have to try the older version uh, from the pull request or build it yourself uh, to try the few things with the floppy that does, does work in CircuitPython. Last weekend, I did finally do a few CircuitPython things. Uh, I put in the second of a pair of PRs to add wrap and wrap target directives for PIO programs. It can increase the performance of your PIO program in some extremely specific cases by removing the need for a jump instruction. Uh, the PRs are both in, uh, but I haven't actually tested it on hardware, so it should be considered experimental. My own use of PIO doesn't need it as urgently as I thought, uh, but I decided to finish the PRs anyway for the sake of completeness. And I did close a couple of PRs of mine that weren't ready and that I had failed for weeks and weeks to get back to. Uh, I would be happy to see anybody else interested in them take them up and finish them. This week, my main goal is to merge MicroPython, I think version 1.18, into CircuitPython. Uh, I don't think it has incompatible changes, but if it does, we will need to hold that until 8.0. So figuring that out will be kind of first on the list and then just getting an idea of the scope of how much work it is. But I have some optimism that I can finish that this week. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. I think you're right. From what I've, my understanding of the latest MicroPython release is that it won't be too bad. My understanding is the next one will involve uh, MPY version change, which we'll, we'll need to do a major release for. Yeah, it sounds like there will be some really good benefits of that, but for our users, we'll have to hold it for 8.0. Yeah, so. I'm very excited about that. Uh, for those of you who haven't been following along, Damien's working on the ability to basically run MPY code from the MPY file, which means that it won't take it won't take as much RAM as it does now, um, which could be really cool. Um, okay, next up is Jerry. Hi again. Um, so for all you RFM nine nine X fans, <laughs> I, I stumbled across a new, at least a new to me library. Um, for the Raspberry Pi for RFM 9X stuff, and uh, the link to it on there. Um, it's it's and in there they explain it, it's outgrowth from other projects that have been around for a long time. But one of the nice things it does it handles interrupts uh, pretty well. And, oh, and um, excuse me. And and does a much better job of um, working with with Arduino. Um, pair, you know, if you pair it with an Arduino board, I've had a lot of trouble with the circuit Python library when you, um, when you're trying to do the reliable datagram mode and do the, the ACK, the ACK um, responses or catch the ACK responses from an Arduino. And, and this seems to do that a lot better. So there's still some quirks I'm, I'm, I'm running into with it, but it's, it's been fun. And so I'll be doing a lot more testing with that, but it looks really, looks like some really promising fixes for the, for the Pi side. Um, also, I found a, a little, a little bug a typo in, in a, in a recent update. So I put it in a PR and I was really pleased to see that the, there's actually, somebody's actively maintaining it because there hadn't been any action on the library in, in about 10 or 11 months, but the PR immediately got, 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 um, accepted and, and, and implemented. So it was good to see. Um, and then if anyone does want to go use it, the if you install it via PIP, you get an older version. Um, they haven't apparently haven't updated their whatever it is to take it, get it out there. So you need to do a local install to get the latest versions, which one nice feature is that it, the old version used to import NumPy, which it didn't need, but it did anyway. And that's been fixed. Um, but one of the things I discovered in doing that 
median was that if you have a, a one of the libraries and you're sitting at the top level of it, all you have to do is a pip3 install dot and it installs the, your local version. So if you make changes, um, apparently that's the proper way of doing this um, with pip and uh, uh, who knew? <laughs> oh, I say, like I said, somebody should write this stuff down. I, mm -hmm. I, I never came across that before. I'd always tried to use setup.py and do an install, which I get all these nasty looking um, dec deprecation errors from. And so it seems to be that's not the way to do it anymore. But um, so, again, I made the last one to, to know that, but it, it's really been nice. And um, so I'll do a bunch more testing on that this week. Um, and then there's a bunch of issues outstanding on the RFM 9X stuff with these modem configurations that just make my head hurt when I try and test them, but I'm keeping to, trying to understand it. And then... I just started uh, on a little trivial PR to the PN532 uh, NFC reader library. Um, a Discord user had reported a, a, a problem when you tried to, when a, if a read failed, um, trying to make it fail more nicely. That's about it. Awesome. Thank you, Jerry. I think the switch to the PIP3 install thing has come about from the Python packaging folks where like there's a lot of different ways to package things now. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than just setup.py. And then, yeah, Dan points out there's the dash E so that it will do sim links instead of um, copying the files over. Oh. And that way nice. you can just edit the files and it will automatically use those again or use the edited version. Cool. Right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Mindful. Thanks, Jerry. All right, next up is Katni. Hello. So last week, I updated the uh, 0.56 inch seven segment backpack with the Stemma QT version. Uh, we updated the board to have Stemma QT connectors and the guide is now updated. Um, I created the dot star single LED uh, status LED template. Um, I hadn't run into needing it yet, so I hadn't generated it. Um, Anne has been running through uh, a lot of board guides and putting all the templates in and obviously um, things like Itsy Bitsy and uh, Trinket have um, dot stars, only one, and needed that template, so I finally got around to doing that. I updated the MCP4725 guide with the STEMI QT version. I created a welcome to CircuitPython Learn group. It's a single link that goes to the foremost linked CircuitPython guides. Groups are something that has been in Learn for a very long time, um, but not very highlighted. Um, so it's something that Learn Dev is working on right now is um, making them more um, forward facing to um, users easier to find um, and making them more useful uh, because they're, they are super easy. It is a very useful feature, um, but like we haven't, we haven't been using it. So there's going to be a page that you can go to that's like an explore page, which will have um, groups on there that have um, a quick description and an and a image. Um, so you kind of can go and say, oh, I want to, I don't know, lightsaber project or whatever, something like that. And then it'll be like, here's all the light sword related projects. Um, and it's all in one place. Uh, so it, it kind of usurps um, needing to search because search doesn't always return what you need. Um, so we're going to start putting more of those together. Um, I decided on doing only one further call for input this year. This was discussed previously um, in my uh, CircuitPython 2022 post and 2020 post, I guess. Um, but I'm going to do a call for input for CircuitPython Day. That's, I believe, August 19th this year. So about a month ahead of time, I think, is about how long we did the one for this year. Um, for, for 2022, I will be putting out a call for input for folks who are interested in um, letting us know uh, what they still want to see out of CircuitPython, um, if there's anything new, um, that sort of thing, whatever comes to mind. Um, who knows where we will be by August uh, with as quickly as CircuitPython evolves. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. that it inspires some new, uh, some new input. I started on the ADXL375 guide. I wrote the ADXL376 37x circuit python library and started writing or started updating the vemel 7700 guide with stemma qt version as well 
Today so far, finished and put the ADXL375 guide into moderation and continued the VEML guide update. Um, this week, which is actually hopefully this afternoon, I'm going to be adding an offsets functionality to the ADXL libraries, starting with the 3.4x. Um, it's uh, basically, it it's a manual calibration where you set it flat and you look at the numbers and you say, okay, it should be zero. Um, it's 15, so you do a minus 15 for the offset. Um, and hopefully I can get that sorted out. Uh, the rest of this week, we'll be finishing the VEML 7700 guide, uh, working on finishing the Feather TFT guide, including CircuitPython demos for the display. There was a lot of feedback on that guide, um, most of which was, hey, the one thing that people want to do is use this TFT. Um, and there's no example for it. So we're going to fix that. I say we, I mean me. Hmm. Um, I'm going to do the essentials template for async IO, which goes along with all the other templates that have been going into the new board guides. Um, that's going to be a simple example uh, pulled from the async IO guide. And um, like I said, will be included in, in, in every one of the board guides. So folks will have a lot more exposure to um, async IO at that point, which will be good. And then once I'm caught up on guides, I still need to get some content up onto circuitpython.org slash trademarks. Um, we do have the content. It's in a very pretty PDF. Um, translating that to uh, HTML is, I, I could make it look pretty ugly and get all the content up there, but it turns out um, Justin, one of our developers, um, has offered to help me make it pretty. So um, I will have help there and hopefully it should um, at least have some resemblance to our fancy PDF. Uh, when it's all said and done. And in other news, I should finally have some time to get back to the mailbox project. This box of parts has been taunting me for a few weeks now. And Jerry, I hope to be pinging you this weekend or possibly this week um, with with some help for getting that going. And that's what I've got. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, we have Kmatch. Hey, thanks, Scott. So this past week, I uh, updated the Focal Touch library. It's a capacitive touch panel library. Uh, that it currently, as it existed, handled screens with one touch point. But I came into a board that, or a touch panel that has another chip that actually can monitor touch, 10 touch points at the same time. So I extended that library to also accommodate that chipset. Uh, next thing uh, is following up on some feedback I'd gotten from Gamblor and Foamy Guy, uh, suggesting on how to consider handling touches uh, using the, the core circuit Python keypad keypad module. Uh, looking at that, it, it looks to store interrupt pin timings in a ring buffer, but I'm not quite sure how I can use that best to trigger a read of my touch panel, since I needed the timing as well as some other data, the position data, uh, pulled by I2C. Uh, but uh, suggestions are welcome on how, how I might do that, or if that's bordering on interrupt handling, maybe that's a core related issue. But any, any suggestions? Feel free to send them along and uh, follow those up. Um, a related note on widgets for displays, I created a CircuitPython org library for a vertical text scrolling box. Uh, and I realized it conflicts with uh, Fomikai's recent uh, horizontal scrolling box, so we may need to reconsider that. So feel free to give suggestions on that, uh, but the link is there. Uh, and I got an ESP32 S3 board and it got REPL running on it. So so a lot of good work everybody's doing to, to make that uh, so easy. Uh, this coming week, uh, I'm going to spend time more on uh, trying to understand touch gestures and how to, how to translate them into just points into some actions. So between one, two, and three points, just a few notes on how I'm thinking about trying to handle it. Okay, But first, I need a way to visualize uh, what's going on. So I'm actually looking at some of the other widgets and how to update them so I can plot you know, some of the motion and velocity acceleration of the touch points so I can not just measure the data and put it in a spreadsheet and then deal with it later. How do I just on the fly display it? So so just following the rabbit uh, hole a little bit further and work on some uh, other libraries in the process. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Kmatch. It makes me... the the. I squared C polling thing is something that's come up a lot. I wonder if we actually need to think of a way of, of doing I squared C data buffering in the background sort of thing. 
could fit into that as well. Um, okay, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Um, last week, I finally finished the little FS porting project and integrated it into the Whippersnapper firmware uploader. So Whippersnapper can now run on the ESP8266. For anyone who's uh, not been following along, that was basically taking the little FS, which was coded in C and converting it to native JavaScript, at least enough of it to be able to create an image. Um, I fixed a weird issue on the 2.7 inch e-ink display in Arduino where the colors got inverted if you use the reset pin. So it wasn't working on the breakout, but it worked fine on the uh, shield. Uh, I fixed an issue with the Raspberry Pi Blink install script when uh, the Python command didn't exist, which wasn't many. That wasn't a common case, but it apparently did happen for some people. Uh, I tested a few PRs that were waiting for my review, and I started adding some new boards to circuitpython.org that were missing. Um, so this week I'm going to finish up adding those boards and then work on catching up on some more GitHub issues and maybe work on some guide updates later. Um, and that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Next up, we have notes from Mark Gambler. So I'll take a time code and read those off. Mark says, last week updated the native module code from MicroPython to work in CircuitPython. Largely untested, but will compile and didn't crash when I ran it. Discussed with Foamy Guy the need for an unzip type function that exists in xmod slash uzlib. This week, uh, time is tight, but I think uh, putting a decompressed module like MicroPython in the shared binding slash mod module pattern is doable. This is similar to what uh, was started in PR 1274. Uh, first try will be just to get it going. The old PR expanded on it, I believe. Uh, and lastly, this week, fixes to the native PR, module PR and example tests Jepler is done. Uh, I do not plan to take this code much further at this time, but if anyone has questions on it, let me know. I could also be convinced to look at it more if there's a lot of interest. Uh, the first look was mostly to learn more about the, that area of the code and to see if I, uh, if I could. All right. Uh, and lastly, I have notes from Tectric. Uh, so Tectric says, last week, learned the ro learning the ropes of re reviewing. Patched the issues with the split documentation sections in the readmes. Uh, worked on some follow-up PRs for the BLE libraries. Uh, fixes for the Blinka CircuitPython typing library. Uh, touching up the cookie cutter per Katni's recommendations. And then this week, uh, taking some time to work on real life stuff, but hopefully some odds and ends like bug fixes and library typing when there's time. And with that, um, we're into our last section in the weeds. Uh, does anybody, I know we're running a little bit later than we have been. Does anybody in, in the weeds need to go first? I don't think, uh, I don't think Melissa or Jeff have, uh, time constraints. Um, I don't either. I have a couple topics in there, but I don't have any time constraints. Alrighty. Um, well, I know some folks have to leave, so uh, in case somebody's about to leave, remember that next week's on Tuesday. Uh, it's 24 hours later than normal. normal. So just, just a reminder uh, to that before we get into some weeds. Um, and with that, Foamy Guy, go ahead and talk about your first, uh, your first item here. All right, uh, let me get scrolled down. So um, this one comes out of uh, something that I was looking at last week, the Web Telescope Data uh, API. That is, This one is directly from NASA, which is nice. Um, but it turns out that there is something um, going on with the SSL, I think it is, um, with that server, I guess, that's leading to us not being able to fetch data from it currently in CircuitPython. And, um, I think it was Anic Data, so a, a late hug report to Anic Data um, tested this out, I think, uh, with the ESP IDF um, example code. So, like, just using directly the ESP IDF and running it on, um, I think, an ESP32 S2. Um, and it seemed to work that way. It was able to successfully um, 
you know, mediate the, the SSL and get the data from there. So um, I guess my question is like, what all goes into updating the ESP IDF in the core? And is that uh, like a whole can of worms that causes a bunch of other problems or is that something that's um, relatively easy to try to tackle? Well, it depends. <laughs> Um, it depends on like what I tend to like to do is tr have us track a branch of the IDF um, that's not the main branch. Um, there's a lot of churn that happens in their main branch, especially right now. Um, so we're on the re we're on the branch for their 4.4 release, um, and so I would so it's easy to update along that release branch. Uh, moving off that release branch to like their master branch is a whole other thing because they're currently working on 5.0, so they're making a lot of changes. Um, okay. So my preference is that we stick kind of along their latest release branch. Um, I would say that if it's not fixed in the newest versions of that, which they do, they do pretty actively fix stuff in. Um, we should bug them about it and see if they'll backport the fix uh, to. To their 4.4 branch. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah, I will. Um, I'll have to dig a little bit and figure out like which version it was specifically. Um, okay. I didn't. I did not end up looking into it. But yeah, I will check on that. And then, uh, if it is, if there is a newer one in that branch that we're not using, we can look into it. If there's not, then I will uh, do what you mentioned and ping them and see if they'd be willing to backport it into that mm -hmm. uh, branch for us. Um, yeah. The other thing we do, we do occasionally have our own um like we ha we have our own version of the idf branch in case we want to apply fixes to it so that's another option that we have um, jeff is asking do we know what the problem is or is it is it ha yeah. does it have to do with the cert a missing certificate it, that is possible. I don't know for sure. I know the the most elaborate error message that we've gotten to come out of it is just like SSL handshake error. Mm -hmm. um, so that does sound like it could be a missing certificate to me. I will say I don't have too much experience with SSL and HTTPS beyond just setting it up and making sure it works. So some of the particulars are a little over my head. Um, is there... Oh yeah, I don't. If if anybody could point me in the right direction to like how to try to test that or how to try adding a different certificate or something like that, I'd be more than happy to um, try to do that. But I don't know exactly how to go about it. I would talk with Brent. I think Brent is the person that, if I need to know SSL certificate stuff, I would talk with Brent. Okay. Um, I will do that because he's done a lot of that for all of the different IoT services that he's worked with. Yeah, that would be, I mean, it it would be ideal, I guess, if that turns out to be the issue. If it's as easy as just updating a cert, that's probably, I would guess, a whole lot a whole lot easier and less likely to be a gigantic ordeal, so. Yeah, and I think, I think we may actually have, like, we're using the certificate bundle that Nina uses as well, which is the one that Brent has maintained for the IO library stuff, IoT library stuff, I think. Okay, so there's there's some possibility there. Maybe that gets it's updated. Um, possibly that resolves it for us. Okay. Yeah, and I think I think the baseline for the certificate bundle comes from like I think Mozilla actually maintains like a bundle of, of root certs. Okay, I think that's where it comes from. Plus, any that we need to add. I will. Uh, I will mention it to Brent. Doesn't look like. Yeah, doesn't look like he's in the chat here. But I'll uh, I'll ask this week about that yeah he should um, he should be responsive if you ping him i think he's around okay um the other one uh I, I think that pretty much covers the first topic unless any anybody has anything else to add um but the uh the second topic here is more along the lines of the gzip uh utilities which i mentioned a little bit earlier so mm -hmm. um quick rundown basically we have this other api uh, which is also actually a u.s government api interestingly enough but this one um we are able to resolve uh, the certs and everything. We don't have that problem with this one, but the data that we get back, um, we tried to parse the JSON that's in it and it doesn't work. And it turns out the reason why is because the data is gzipped. Um, so the server always returns the data gzipped. The browsers on PCs just automatically unzip it and show it to you. 
Um, but so far, our libraries uh, like requests and uh, like ESP32 spy and, and stuff like that, and the, the Wi-Fi libraries in the core, they don't do any of that automatic unzipping. And so we have kind of, I guess, two, two paths forward that I see. One of them is um, basically turning it on inside the core, the ability to un unzip or, or uzip, I guess probably microzip is the name. Um, there is a module from MicroPython that exists. It's just not turned on in CircuitPython. Somebody had started a PR at one point to do it, but there were some additional changes um, that were requested and that person didn't end up, I guess, wanting to do it. So um, it ended up getting a little stale, but if we now have a, a specific need for it, maybe now is the time to finish that up and then get it merged that way, in which case um, then either user code or library code could make use of it. Um, so that's one option is kind of like turning it on in the core, getting that PR resolved or starting a new one. Um, the other one is going with just like pure Python uh, inflation code, which does exist. There's an older library out there called PyFlate. Um, I think I mentioned before it, it needed to be updated because it hadn't been uh, updated in quite a while. It was using Python 2 code, um, but that did get updated and we were able to successfully use it. So that's kind of the other option is doing the inflating from pure Python code. Um, and then I will mention kind of the one sort of follow-up step beyond either of those. It doesn't really matter which one of those two we choose. Uh, both of them will give us the ability to inflate gzip data. And so then the next question becomes like, do we want to have uh, requests or some other library that's in the stack try to automatically handle it? I noticed on CPython requests, um, I can fetch that same URL and it does seem to just silently do the unzipping. Um, so I figured it might be nice to match, but I could also see a case to be made like it's adding extra stuff into requests and not everybody will need it. So maybe it makes more sense to just say like user code needs to fetch it and then unzip it manually rather than um, it just kind of magically happening when you get when you do the request. I think I think if you I think you probably want it to behave the same, but you need to be careful and like like I did some work to make sure that when we JSON decode stuff, we don't have to load the entire giant string. Yeah. So like making sure that we can gzip kind of on demand, not all at yeah. once. Yeah, that was, I started kind of looking into that front. Really, I started looking at it from the angle of trying to make requests give a better error uh, when mm -hmm. it came across gzipped data. And that was something I noticed is that there's, so, something with read into it's basically like it looks like it's being able to parse the JSON um, in a in a buffered way without doing all of it at once. And I right. did have some trouble trying to figure out how to like read the first couple of bytes and then I would from those decide if it's gzip data or not. And then if it is, raise that new error. Or if it isn't, then just do the normal stuff. But what I was finding is it seems like the way that buffered loading occurs. Um, it, it almost seemed to me like it was one time. Like as soon as I accessed the data the first time, it didn't really want to let me access it anymore. So yeah, I think the only I think it is. Okay, I think yeah. It, so I think the it only, might be destructive. Right. The only I way I would it. know around that is like storing it, which did seem not ideal since it would cause it to all the whole JSON to get loaded in memory. So um, that's I, another I, kind of wrinkle is uh, if we do want it to be automatic, we'll have to figure out a way to kind of peek at the first couple of bytes without um, losing access to the rest of them. I don't think you need to do that. I thought there was a header field that says that it's compressed. So you know before you get to the body that it's going to be compressed. Yes. I, I do think there is a header in this case. Um, yeah, it returns the header content encoding with the value gzip. Which, oh, okay. this is utterly broken because you, it shouldn't send back gzip unless you say you will accept it. And even yeah. if you say accept encoding identity, which means it shouldn't compress it, it still returns it compressed. I think this website is broken, personally. Um, I but, tend to you know, agree. But I suspect the government will not look into it and fix it in any sort of timely manner. Um, I, I think that, I think that gzip support could be really helpful right like like especially for embedded because you're t like a lot of apis are giant text blobs and giant text blobs compress really well so like 
I think it, it I think it's a worthwhile feature for us to have even if the reason that we have to add it is this broken website. Okay. So and it does look like I'm looking at the header it does come back with content encoding gzip. So I don't right. think I've done it before but I assume that requests the request library must give us a way to access the headers so I could check that header and use yeah. that as the key to know um I think it just has dot headers. Yeah. Cuz it's got to load it to know whether it's chunked and stuff. I think. Okay. I will, um, I'll try that. I think short term is just make requests, try to throw a better uh, error so that the next person that comes along, it will get a clear message that the data is just needs to be unzipped. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know Mark Gambler was gonna look into that core PR. We also have the follow-up option if that doesn't pan out for any reason, the, uh, the Python code. So um, is there any opinion on whether requests would handle it automatically um, to match the C Python? I think it should because that's the way the regular request library. We try to make it want to make it be like the regular request library. Yeah, yeah it so, should. I would say it should if it can, and if it can't, it should do the the nicer exception that you're talking about adding. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's really all that goes into that, unless anybody has anything more to add. But that gives me uh, the next couple of stones to try to hop to. So. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just say that uzlib has a stream API. Oh, nice. So that can maybe okay. work sort of the same way that the JSON yeah. is yeah. Um, yeah. doing its buffered stuff. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Well, thank okay. you. Thank you to looking into for looking into that. It's like twelve. What was it? Twelve something PR. Like, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> pretty awesome that it's something we wanted to do for a while. Um, yeah. Yeah, and a huge thanks as well. I'll mention again to Anic Data and Airdoc, both both of whom I would not have been able to get even this far without. So thank you to those folks as well. Cool. All right. Um, thank you, Foamy Guy. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. So uh, one of the issues that we're running into is on certain boards like the Matrix Portal, uh, just the whole bundle of libraries that we need to add onto the board are really too large for it to run and so uh we uh lamar had suggested uh freezing in like the um portal based library for instance into there i noticed there's some other libraries that it are used on the matrix portal for instance uh like the request library that are supposedly in the frozen folder but they're also not accessible, so I don't know how that exactly works. They're in the frozen folder, but they're not accessible? So right. Like, if I want to import Adafruit requests, for instance. So just because it's in the frozen folder doesn't mean it's enabled for a particular board. Okay. You have to actually enable frozen libraries for a specific board. So Circuit Playground Express, for example, if you go into one of the... Um, board files i don't remember which one it should be pretty obvious mm -hmm. um there's like frozen libraries like are listed and they're enabled in that you know for that particular board so if you wanted to freeze requests for example into matrix portal you would have to actually go into the board file and and set that yeah okay that's, that's it right there so that's one thing uh now like bus device is frozen into there even though it's not specified so i don't know if that's like a certain one that's frozen into all boards we have bus a... device now is native yeah ah okay that's what i didn't realize okay and you're doing this melissa for memory savings is that your goal yeah okay so this is the thing that hopefully the newer version of micropython will fix for us Okay, cool. Um, but in the meantime, I think it's fine to freeze it in. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, with portal base, we're using it on several different boards. So. Mm -hmm. Melissa, if you yeah. need help, feel free to ask. Okay. It's also not updated very often anymore, so it seems like a candidate. Right. Uh, that's it for me. Sweet. Thank you. That was a, a quick one. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, last up, we have Jepler. Hello, I think Scott, this may be a you have opinions kind of question. Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't ever have opinions. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but uh, with Mark reviving the interest in the so-called native modules, um, which if you're not familiar with them, um, 
they are a way to include uh, code compiled for the microcontroller in an MPY file, and it's potentially more efficient. Anyway, are there some boards where we want to consider enabling it? I think it's possible that the RP2040 and Espressif boards, um, given that they have a lot of RAM comparatively, seem like good um, candidates. But, um, you know, if we're going to work on making this work and take pull requests about it, we should enable it for some people, uh, you know, for some boards where we think it could be useful to people. Um, so he, uh, here's what I'll say. I'm not against it, but I think that there's a big hurdle that needs to be figured out before it's something that we actually support. And it's the idea that native modules are port specific, or at least CPU architecture specific. Yeah, there would be two different forms. There'd be one for the um, Espressif CPU boards and one for the ARM boards, and maybe different ones for the ARM with and without hardware floating points. So there are going to be some variables there for sure. Right, right. Yeah, so I think I think we just need to make it very clear, probably in both the file naming, like the file naming needs to include like what architecture it's geared towards. So that we can just be like, oh yeah, like you need a file that has this extension instead of just doing MPY, right? Because MPY will work across architectures as long as it doesn't have native code. Um, and then we should have really good error messages when people do try to or 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 have a, the wrong architecture file there as yeah. well. Those, those are good points. I hadn't thought about actually using the extension. What I think MicroPython does is their convention is, like, say your module is um, foo. They will name the MPY file foo underscore x64.mpy, where x64 is the common instruction set for desktop computers, which was what I was testing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's in the name, but it's not in the extension. So we could potentially change that part of it, I guess. You know, makes us do more work, but it could be better for users. I am pretty sure that when it's brought in, you get a decent error message mm -hmm. uh, rather than just running code that is uh, meaningless to the microcontroller that you have. But I would have to double check on that. Yeah, that, so so that's my concern. Like, I'm not against native modules. I'm concerned about the maintenance burden of folks that are trying to use native modules that are for the wrong platform. Um, yeah. So there may also be some tooling that we need to do around native, like libraries that use native modules. Maybe we actually need to say, like, if it's generic, it needs to actually like have a CI tooling that generates all the different combinations of architectures that it's. Yeah, CI tooling would be a whole new thing before we could ship like uh, installable via CIRCUP modules. So that right. would definitely be you know part of the whole solution. Yeah, so I think how much of that we really feel we need to have in in place before we would enable it in the. You know, my gut would be. Right. We can enable it in the core, and then we don't even need to take advantage of it right away, but we've enabled our advanced users to test it out and kick the tires. We'll find out more of the details about it from them as we create the tooling, the rest of the tooling around it. Right. Yeah, well, but, but, it, but at the same time, like any conventions that you want to establish are easier to establish up front. So like, maybe, it's, maybe we should check file extension just to force it, right? Like to, to check the file suffix just to make sure that it follows that convention. Sure. Uh, would, would you be willing, Scott, to after the meeting, just write up a few of those thoughts, kind of a checklist for what we would do before we would enable it, uh, maybe on either uh, Mark's pull request or mine that's related to this? Because otherwise I'd be tempted to just go enable it for Fed RP2040. Uh, you know, for my own convenience and testing and just put it in the branch and then it would be there. Do we have do we have a native modules issue already? Uh, I don't actually know if there's an issue. Mark and I were both working on separate pull requests. Okay, because I think I think an issue may be the right place to track these like higher level like goals. Yeah, no, that would be good too. Um, and then we could just link link to that issue from the PRs. Yes, exactly. 
Um, let me make a note to myself on some paper that is on my desk. Um, I'm going to have to go get lunch here shortly, so if I'm going to do something today, I need to note it down. All right. Like, In, anybody else who wants to chime in about that? I, I guess the other thing I will note about native modules before we move on is um, I don't think that there's a way to like efficiently work with a with our kind of shared module objects. Like you can't write a common HAL call inside of a native module because they aren't available in the the linkage mm -hmm. between them. And so we might also in the future figure out here are the things that we're going to add and make available um, from a native module that are in addition to what MicroPython. Has. Uh, they basically don't have any of the machine interface stuff in there, and I'm not sure, you know, you couldn't create a, an I squared C thing right. with it. Right. I just think it doesn't work. It's for compute stuff. So it's great for uh, being able to import Zlib, which is one of the example modules, um, but it's not great for I want to implement uh, an I2C driver that needs to go in the core or operate in the background. Thing. So it has limitations. Mm -hmm. Right, but I think I think that's a really good point that could could justify it. Like, like our our bus I/O and digital I/O and microcontroller APIs are pretty damn stable. So, like, I would be okay making those kind of public APIs in the sense that native modules can link against them. If it means that for these folks like uh, Kmatch that want to be able to do background background stuff <laughs> for I squared C, maybe that's the way to do it. Yeah, as far as I understand it, there's kind of two costs to adding these things. And there, there um, is the you're committed to it cost. Right. And there's the um, you pay like the cost of one function pointer within Flash for each thing that you expose. And that cost is pretty minor mm -hmm. at the scale of the RP2040's uh, spy flash right. memory. Right. Um, but the, the one where you're committed to it. And also, we might end up wanting to, uh, we need probably need two separate tables or something so that when MicroPython adds four more items, mm -hmm. they don't go in the position where four, our first four items are. Right. Otherwise, it becomes a compatibility nightmare. So we might need to, to do something else before we go adding to adding APIs that aren't in MicroPython. Right. Yeah, I think it. I think it could be really interesting, especially if that's our solution to the background story. If we actually, and maybe what we also need to do in in the common hal naming is actually call them like public common hal. <laughs> like I know they're super long right now, but yeah, your names are getting really long, Scott. I but but in this case, I think it would be really nice for us to distinguish common hal APIs that we think are private in the sense that native modules can't deal with them and then the ones that are public, right? Like, it is important to have that distinguish, distinction. Just how about just public how? Yeah, it could just be public how, yeah. That would be fine. Um, but yeah, having a, if we expose, or if or when we, ex we expose those things, like just having a way to designate them as such. Yeah, I think proving that we could do just pure compute native modules first is the way to go, and then figuring out, you know, what is what is the good subset to expose uh, of CircuitPython specific hardware APIs would be a second thing that we could look at. Even you know, version nine. I don't. We we don't have to get that right up front. We can wait before wait and do anything until later. Right, right. Yeah, I I think you're right in that we should figure out what the baseline we want to do is and before we turned it on so that people could just experiment with it. So I agree with you there. All right, well, that, uh, that answers what I was looking for. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for bringing that up, Jeff. And let's go to the meeting wrap up. I will take one final time code. Um, first and foremost, uh, an re another reminder that next week is a day later than normal. So we'll see you on Tuesday, February 22nd at the normal time. 
Um, thank you all for joining us. Let me stall while I scroll down in our in our overview doc. Uh, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly for February 14th, 2020. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, then those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held on Tuesday next week, so 24 hours later than normal, but at the usual time, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. And to be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPython Nisa's role on Discord. And with that, we hope to see you all next week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.